Okay, I uh, think we can, uh, we can start by now. Uh, my name is Erling Jelsø and from Roskilde University here in Denmark and I'm going to chair this session uh, about um, health and self-tracking data. Uh, and we have three presentations, which means that we have a little less than half an hour for each presentation. And I think each presenter will spend 18, 19 minutes uh, for their presentation. So we still got approximately 10 minutes for questions and discussion. And um, I mean, I, I'm going myself to make the first presentation uh, and I will notify the speakers, uh, except myself, about when time is <laughs> up. So if I, if I can't keep my time, <laughs> you better notify me. <laughs> Any, anyhow, um, my presentation uh, is called, as you see, self-tracking as health promotion. Well, that worked. Um, since it's about health, I think it's worthwhile starting to, to emphasize that uh, self-tracking by means of digital and other devices is a way to in obtain information about one's own, own body, not just for the purpose of health, as uh, Deborah Lupton has, has said it in her book about uh, self-tracking and, and the quantified self. More generally, you could say that they are aiming at self-improvement and self-reflection Health is only one of a number of potential uh, motives for doing self-tracking. But having said that, health is very often uh, one of the most prominent motives for doing uh, self-tracking, self-measurements, self-monitoring. And um, in order to, in one way or the other, improve healthy living, and in that way you can, and that's my, what I'm going to talk about, in that way you can say that self-tracking can be a means for um, practicing health promotion. And when we are talking about health, it's very important to distinguish bet between two very different uh, contexts for self-tracking. Um, we have the self-initiated application where healthy people with no direct relation to the healthcare sector are monitoring, measuring, uh, obtaining data uh, about their own uh, body. And then we have the institutionalized application within the healthcare sector, often initiated or most frequently actually initiated by health professionals doing surveillance diagnosis, treatment, using people, uh, using data that people provide through self-monitoring, often associated with telemedicine uh, and, and uh, things like that. I'm not going to talk about this, but it's important because if you read about papers about uh, self-tracking uh, and health, self-monitoring, you will very often see great expectations expressed from people within the healthcare sector, from pol politicians and decision makers in health policy to all the savings and improvements they anticipate from these kinds of activities. For instance, the EU Green Paper on mobile health. But I'm in this uh, context, I'm dealing with the first category even though, as I say, they are connected in, in various ways, or maybe connected at least. Um, and well, no matter how you consider the issue, uh, then health promotion and self-tracking very often has a focus on the individual. Um, and in, in this sense, self-tracking uh, seems to go well uh, together with the aims of health promotion, at least as it's understood, and that's my in a, a very important point in this uh, context, it's understood uh, in as I mean dominantly by health authorities, health professionals, and so on in most countries internationally as something that has to do with the individual. And um, health promotion, uh, I mean. 
very, very often, with a few ex uh, prominent exceptions, then health promotion has to do with encouraging citizens to have a healthy lifestyle through campaigns, through information, uh, based on an understanding and identification of risk factors. And uh, in this conception, health promotion is understood as the res responsibility of the individual, uh, which is reflecting, in my view, a rational neoliberalism, uh, as Lupton mentioned herself too. Um, but, well, a, f a few exceptions from this uh, dominant trend is, for instance, the Norwegian uh, health policy, which is much more oriented towards um, a broader uh, policy of a more collective um, orientation. And my point here, uh, is that health promotion is not necessarily associated with a focus on individual lifestyles, though it's often pictured as, pictured as such. And uh, if, you, if you consider one of the most important papers in, I think, in the history of, I mean, health promotion as a concept, you can go to the WHO Otto Web Charter from 1986. And uh, this charter, uh, conveys a very different form of uh, understanding of health promotion, emphasizing healthy public policy, supportive environments, strengthen community actions, develop personal skills that can enable people to not just to do what the authorities say, but to master their own health and to reorient health services so that they don't, they are not only concerned with the healthcare sector, but has to do with health in, in all sectors of society and in, in all parts of in, uh, people's lives. And this is directly taken from the Ottawa Charter. I mean, here I've listed some key elements of health promotion, a focus on social determinants of health, um, health inequalities, which we have in all developed countries to a varying extent, but here in Denmark it's very pronounced. Emphasizing community health, commu communities that support people in improving their health, health promotion initiatives in social settings that is, initiatives are not just directed at the individual, but in those social settings where people actually live and work in institutions like schools and um, workplaces and so on, and resource mobilization and empowerment. And then, very importantly also, I think the, the Ottawa Charter say, states that health is seen as a resource for everyday life in accordance with these activities. It's not the object, the objective of living. So um, then you must ask about the social aspects of cell tracking um, and how they are expressed in those activities that uh, has been uh, discussed and focused on uh, in recent years to a large extent. And they are concerned very much with the self and with the individual person's own data. And so you might ask, how does that, how does that cope with uh, these principles of a more social oriented health promotion? One might suggest that there's actually uh, no obvious connection and that self-tracking is not compatible with uh, a social oriented uh, health promotion activity. But, I mean, self-tracking is not a purely individual undertaking. That's what most people who are studying these activities know. It's um, sharing of data and communication is, is actually uh, a very prominent feature of, of self-tracking uh, self activities. 
which has been pointed out by a lot of those who has, have studied uh, the activity. Uh, Deborah Lopton said that in her presentation as well. So we might ask, are there any of these, this share, any, any part of this sharing of data that might be compatible with a more social, socially oriented uh, kind of, of health promotion? And uh, the answer is yes and no, of course. Uh, I mean, if you, are, if you are considering through studies of self-tracking, um, I mean, how data sharing, what is the purpose of data sharing, why do people share data with us, then gamification pops up very often as an important element. There's a kind of a competition or game between people about, well, I have improved my health, I have obtained this and that, I can walk so many steps every day and all that. And also self-presentation, people are using uh, social media to, I mean, expose their own achievements rather than, I mean, actually uh, using their data for uh, exchange of experience about how to support each other improving, uh, improving the health. So, I mean, these may be seen as, by and large, as barriers to uh, a social orientation uh, in, in uh, data sharing. Um, and that reminds me, I mean, or actualizes a discussion that was raised already when Howard Ringgold wrote his famous book about virtual community. Uh, in which he uh, emphasized uh, some collective goods associated with virtual communities. He said there's social network capital, there's knowledge capital, and there's communion. And these values are actually in agreement with, basically at least, with uh, social health promotion. So in that sense, you might say, well, this is a virtual community and it's it uh, is in agreement with the idea of health promotion. What's the matter? I mean, he, every, as the debate about that book um, made clear, it has, he has been criticized for idealizing internet communities and also for technolo technological determinism since he actually more or less uh, related all these uh, virtues of uh, of um, the virtual community to, I mean, the appearance of the emergence of the internet. And I think this criticism is also relevant to a discussion about uh, self-tracking communities. Um, and my point is that Sharing of data and that, I mean, as I've already uh, said, sharing of data does not necessarily imply formation of, uh, of communities of mutually supported participants. And uh, another question which is inherent in, in all uh, discussions about social self, uh, health promotion is whether such communities can support social vulnerable groups and, and there are many reasons why this is uh, a key problem because, I mean, many, many social <laughs> vulnerable groups do not have the resources to undertake uh, such activities as self-tracking and to, to communicate with other people about them. And many of their problems are so fundamental that I mean, they can't, uh, they can't reasonably see how they could share those problems over the internet, maybe. Um, and so the technology, and that's my suggestion, the technology itself is not enough. Um, we need social contexts in which such problems can be overcome. 
And um, the point is uh, also that, I mean, many search trackers has an obsession with quantified data. Um, and I mean, the problem is uh, really not the data themselves, but how they are interpreted, how they are translated. I think <laughs> Deborah Lobson gave a very comprehensive account of that issue in her presentation. It was very interesting in that respect. But the point is, of course, as pointed out by others too, that data are, of course, not just data. They are, they are interpreted and translated into narratives uh, about uh, people's lives and utilized as such. And how can, how can such narratives make the basis for social support? Most of the narratives, uh, if we're talking about health, has to do with, well, how can I improve my lifestyle or things like that? How can I become even healthier? But maybe you should ask, how can I strengthen my resources and capabilities and how can others support me in doing that? And how can such social support through sharing of data be accomplished? Um, if you're reading accounts of the uh, quantified self-movement, then you will actually see many accounts of, of uh, such mutual support. But I don't think that is representative uh, for, I mean, the broader community of self-trackers. And also, most of the technologies that are available for self-tracking are designed to meet the individual's quest for self-tracking and, sh and shape the individual. So technologies are not neutral entities that can be used for almost everything. They are part of a social context and developed as such. And that's also part of the problem um, which can set, a, set barriers to, to a development like this. Well, then you might ask which social context would be interesting in this uh, connection. And my, I'm running out of time, but <laughs> um, the smart city might be one concept that could uh, act as a framework for community health in this context. Um, for many, to many, it's associated with surveillance and, and control, but of course, it also offers opportunities for self-tracking uh, in relation to utilization of resources, um, I mean, actions in light of air pollution and so on. And uh, it, in that sense, it might also be uh, a context for health-related um, for health-related uh, behavior in the city. Um, but my, my suggestion here, which I'm not able to elaborate on right now, is that it, 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 has, it, it, it has certain uh, preconditions. Group of citizens must have access to data generation, but they must also have, I mean, take part in, in, in decisions about how to use the data. And, well, this is my conclusion. Communities, community orientation is actually an element in self-tracking activities, but often in an individualizing context. For instance, as I said about in relation to gamification and self-presentation. Uh, so if we want to develop virtual communities that can engage in social health promotion, it will depend on citizens who set new agendas for use and development of data and technologies. So this was my conclusion. Thank you. I almost kept the time, so. <laughs> um, any questions or comments? Uh, you were first. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for a great presentation. I'm really happy to see the broader perspective of health promotion coming out, so it's not just you know, uh, more thank tracks, you. Uh, more steps equals better um, health levels. Um, but I was wondering as you were going through this um, that perhaps we also as researchers tend to look very specifically only at self-tracking devices because these mm -hmm. devices are already always in a context. Mm -hmm. So I've done some studies in a workplace for example 
and step trackers in the workplace, this was not the only initiative. They also had healthy food in the canteen. They also oh, yeah. had physiotherapists. Mm -hmm. They also had Certainly. all of this. So they know that self tracking in and of itself is not going to do anything. It, it is going to be in combination with a lot of other things. So um, I was just wondering if you could comment on this. Do we put too much focus on just because we just are interested in self tracking? Do we forget the broader co context which always surrounds these technologies? Um. I think it's a very important point, uh, and, and, and of course the situation may vary. I mean, I've also read about studies that uh, focused on, on uh, very narrowly on, on uh, how to motivate people to, to uh, get a break and do exercise and all that as part of their work day. But I mean, you're right, many of those companies that are applying various uh, health promotion activities are certainly also focusing on, on healthy eating and all that. But it's, I mean, within the same kind of understanding of the, I mean, the scope of health promotion as, well, eat healthy, improve your lifestyle and so on. Uh, and so I think those companies are also very often, I mean, Companies uh, with many uh, well-educated people. I mean, elite, elite companies that want to attract um, qualified uh, work, a qualified workforce by means of offering health promotion activities. So, I think the picture is more complicated than than that. But I I agree that you have to to reflect on the, or, or include this broader context. Okay. Well, yes, thank you very much. Um, I was a bit curious on what ground you build your argument here, because, um, well, somehow I, I think it's a bit, uh, you're a bit too pessimistic re regarding the community potentialities in, 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 in the technology. <laughs> and that was, that is based on, on I did a small scale uh, qualitative study on the use of uh, of these technologies for exercise, mm. and in fact, we found a lot of people. A lot of those people that we had in our sample, they were uh, communicating, sharing uh, with with peers all the time, and it was not just about gamification. Okay. In fact, gamification was only uh, predominant for those people who were having a strong track record in sports. <coughs> and have been doing competitive sports for, for, for a long while. Whereas those who were newcomers in, in exercises, they were uh, starting building up many of those people and many women were actually <coughs> building up small communities with family, uh, family peer or mm -hmm. with peers from their working places, with peers, uh, friends, close friends, but, but small communities. And they were doing a lot of uh, supportive work in encouraging each other to, well, you're doing a good job, keep on going. So, so I think you you shouldn't give up on that that well, part of it. <laughs> okay, I, I was I didn't mean to say that um, gamification and self presentation is all that there is to say about self tracking. Mm -hmm. I just say they are important elements. And I think those studies are indeed very important to, to, to get a more nuanced picture of what's going on. I have to admit, I should have said that in the beginning, I just forgot that my, uh, my work so far is work in progress mm. and based on literature, not my own studies. And, and I'm sure there's much more to it. I mean, I, I actually, from, from the outset, I had the idea that there were a lot of potentials in, in uh, data sharing and so on. And then, of course, getting into the matter, I realized that there are so many barriers and so much complexity. So that dominated maybe my presentation, but it's very important to do some more empirical studies and, and get a, a broader picture of what's going on. I, I certainly agree. Okay, yes? Uh, just to, to add to that, I think that where communities come in is, is providing some place to maybe sustain that because I've also just completed a, a, a study with older people who were who have been using self-tracking technologies for a long time and they had zero interest in the community aspect after the first couple of weeks. It was something that interested them at the start but after a while it, you know they just 
they said, yeah, I used to have some you know, connections and friends. So I think there's maybe a role in the community for an infrastructure that will, will support and develop those kinds of connections. Thank you. Okay, I think we will have to go on. And thank you very much for your comments. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Rabia, who will uh, talk about the mundane experience of everyday calorie trackers beyond the metaphor of the quantified self. And I'm sure you will sell, you will <laughs> pronounce your last name yourself. <laughs> okay. uh, so hello, my name is Kabia Dijakaita. Uh, I'm from Loughborough University in the UK and I'm going to talk uh, about my research that I did with my supervisors Paula Salko and Christian Grafenhagen. Uh, so it will be about the mundane experience as everyday uh, calorie trackers. And if you find this presentation interesting or you want to learn more about this, you can find um, an article uh, on which this presentation is based in New Media and Society. It has just recently been published. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, I'm sure most of you know about the quantified self community, and Deborah Lupton mentioned it in her presentation as well. Um, so, but just to give you a, an idea if you're not familiar, so quantified self community is a community of like minded individuals who come to share their self-tracking activities in conferences and as well as in meetups. Um, and as one of the participants of the community said, what distinguishes them uh, from self-tracking in general is that they're very much interested in the uh, process of tracking itself. Um, and because they are, they, as Deborah Lupton mentioned, they were founded by two Wired uh, editors and they have quite prominent uh, picture uh, in the media and they kind of often come to represent self-tracking both in the media and literature. Uh, they can almost be seen as to um, represent self-tracking in, in our understanding of self-tracking and uh, kind of be a picture of self-tracking when when media talks about quanti uh, quantified self, they also they almost use it synonymously uh, for self-tracking. Um, and this presentation is also based on article of Rockenstein and Panzer, which was uh, also published in uh, Media and Society in 2015, where they talk about the metaphor of the quantified self. So they analyzed. Uh, articles on self-tracking in the Wired magazine and wanted to understand uh, kind of how self-tracking is presented there. And they found that a quantified self is almost an ontological metaphor for self-tracking. It is used to categorize and identify key aspects of this new phenomena. And as SDS researchers have showed, metaphors are very powerful tools and they can really aid the discussions and find, can help find common grounds in discussions about new technologies, but they also reflect only very certain points and certain understanding of those technology. And uh, this is the case also in the quantified self metaphor and Ruckenstein and Panzer argues that there are these four aspects uh, that they identified in those articles about quantified, uh, about self-tracking that quantified self-metaphor highlights. So there is the idea of transparency, um, the wish of op optimizing performance, possibilities of feedback loops and biohacking. And with this work we want to shift focus in understanding self-tracking uh, from members of the quantified self community to people who engage in self tracking uh, but without being part of any community and without being part of quantified self. And um, using this idea of Bakardieva and Smith uh, of ordinary man and woman, which they use in their early internet um, use studies, where they uh, meant by this ordinary man and woman, they meant uh, people who are not kind of. Uh, who are not making these technologies, who are not uh, developing the software, but who are simply using internet. And, and building on this idea, we talk about everyday self-trackers. Um, so 
in my research, I interviewed uh, 31 uh, individuals who used uh, MyFitnessPal, which is a calorie counting and diet tracking app. Um, and I looked for individuals who would, uh, had already been using this technology, so I didn't ask people to use it, but I was looking for someone who has voluntarily did it for themselves before or even during the time of interviews. And MyFitnessPal is one of the most popul popular calorie counting apps, and according to their state statistics, they have 165 million of users. And of course, uh, it's a bit, um, bit, it's doubtful how they count the active users, but <laughs> <laughs> it will be probably in the range of several millions of users. Uh, and it's free, you can go to, uh, you can pay to get uh, extra features of the app, but it, it's, it's free and it's easily accessible and it's about counting the calories uh, to reach your weight goals. So I chose this app because I thought, um, you know, it's easily accessible and a lot of people already know about it. So it will be easier for me to find individuals who are using it. Um, and based on these interviews, we identified uh, three key themes related to self-tracking in our interview material which contrasts with the way uh, in which self-tracking is typically talked about in the literature on self-tracking. So uh, these will be goals, use, and effects. So I have these tables here that kind of juxtapose the quantified self-metaphor and the way that um, self-tracking is talked about under it and, and then the everyday calorie trackers, which will be uh, findings uh, about my uh, participants. So the goal is under quantified self-metaphor. Um, Self-knowledge remembers, so this is the quantified self-community uh, motto. The people who are engaging in quantified uh, in self-tracking under quantified self-metaphor, they are data hungry, they want to understand their choices, uh, their behavior, kind of to collect data, almost to fill in blind spots. And in my case, uh, the participants were collecting data mainly to lose weight or to um, kind of control their weight, maintain weight. Sometimes they wanted to gain weight. Um, again, unquantified self-metaphor, the goal is the self-optimization. Um, the idea that people will want to improve various, um, various aspects of life, whether it's health or, uh, or maximize their efficiency, so this kind of a pursuit of uh, optimal human being. Whereas, again, in everyday calorie trackers, the goal was more related to wish to look better, sometimes to be healthier. But when I was talking to my participants, they would be, you know, preparing for a wedding and therefore they wanted to look better or they were going on a beach holiday and they wanted to, you know, put on their bikini, so that's why they wanted to lose weight or, you know, to fit into their skinny jeans. Um, so it's a kind of a, a different outlook to the goals. And then the use. Again, in quantified self-metaphor, what we found was that a lot of, um, a lot of times uh, the user is dis discussed as having very critical approach to data, to norms and suggestions, so they wouldn't um, wouldn't necessarily trust the norms that technology offers. So, you know, for example, if you have a Fitbit that says you have to walk 10,000 steps, uh, under the quantified self metaphor, the user might be, you know, finding a better number, a more individually suited number for their own health, for their own benefits, it would be 7,000 steps or 15,000 uh, steps. Um, and in terms of everyday calorie trackers, our participants were really trusting the technologies and trusting the data that it was offering so when I would ask them whether they would ever want to you know question or or change the calorie goal that the app sets them for the day they would also say they would often say that they kind of they wouldn't they don't have the knowledge they don't know enough about calories to engage in such thing and then they would say you know this app is made by the experts so I trust the uh, the app to give me the right kind of um, <laughs> number of calorie for the day. Uh, then quantified self-metaphor portrays um, the users as kind of hackers tinkering with the hardware, um, almost creating their own software, trying to individualize that technology. 
maybe they are building their own personal tools. And in terms of more our participants, they would almost often use well, only the basic functions of the app. Um, you know, they would rarely go beyond the first few screens of the app. Uh, and a lot of them would even either wouldn't know how to use or wouldn't necessarily know uh, about such features as the barcode scanner, which is basically a selling point for the app. And um, as one of uh, participants put to me, when I asked her if, sh if she is using that b uh, barcode scanner, she would say, you know, well, I'm not technically particularly brilliant, so I'm not really, you know, even venturing to understand what's beyond, you know, what the first few screens of the app. And under the quantified self metaphor, the user is almost like a lay scientist. Um, they're really engaging with the data they have collected. They're looking uh, back uh, to find some trends and patterns, and they're analyzing sometimes more in sophisticated ways, sometimes and quite simple statistical analysis. And our participants, they almost never looked back on the data they collected. So they would rarely look at the historical data to see you know, any kind of trends of eating habits or something like that. Most often, they would have this perspective view. So the app, at the end of the day, says, um, if you continue eating this amount of calories, you will lose, for example, like five kilograms in two months. And you know this is what they would be looking for, this kind of uh, future that the app was promising them. And the effects. Um, so under the quantified self metaphor, um, data helps to understand and create the self. Um, user is highly self-reflective, and he, he or she is collecting data to become kind of a better person. Um, and in everyday self-calorie trackers, what changes is the kind of the perception of foods. They often want to be more mindful about what they're eating because every food that you choose, you have to enter into um, into the app. So you know, uh, it's kind of like a break point between eating uh, and yeah. Um, and then under the quantified self metaphor. Self-quantification becomes a way of living. So um, the idea is that you know you want to more about yourself, so you collect the data, and then you know more about the self, and you can prove yourself, and then you collect the data. And this is kind of a, a continuous circle of collection and improvement kind of almost throughout the life, because you're all always seeking to become a better uh, individual. And so there, there is this data-driven life as uh, the um, uh, founder of Quantified Self, Gary Wolf, uh, has uh, written an article about. And, and everyday calorie trackers, what we found was that um, usually people use this app for a very few months. Um, I mean, maybe two or three people out of 31 use it for a year or more. Usually it's for a month or two or three months, uh, as long as it takes for you to reach the, the weight loss goal. And similarly, the effects of it wear off. So pe once they stop using the app, they stop perceiving food as calories. They stop, uh, you know, thinking more about food before they choose it. And similarly, um, it, the the weight that they lose often comes back be when they stop lose using the app. <coughs> so in conclusion, um, we try to shift the attention to ordinary users as quantified self metaphor skews our understanding of self-tracking uh, and fosters unwarranted visions and expectations as in, was mentioned in the previous presentation. And we, we suggest that the features of self-tracking image as indicated by the QS metaphor are exaggerated when compared to real life self-tracking practices, both in the positive sense of creative use and in the negative sense of relentless disciplining and or optimizing all areas of life. And based on our findings, a new picture of subtracking emerge. So maybe instead of transform transforming and personalizing technologies, uh, people are using them in limited and less enth enthusiastic manner. Maybe instead of a fundamental change, we see a rather a temporary and very specific incremental change. Thank you. Any questions? Okay.
Okay. You were first there. Okay, so thank you very much for this, and I want to congratulate you on the paper. It's a really good paper. I must read for everyone interested. In um, but I was wondering if you, you could comment on one specific thing, which has to do with the uh, inscribed use of really the technology, as Nana Gorm and others have argued. Then uh, that those who design technologies are typically associated with uh, the quantified self movement, or have uh, a technological uh, savviness that ordinary users obviously do not have. Yeah. So if that, if the inscribed user is like the quantified self users, what kinds of implications do you think it has for the mundane users that you sketch? Uh, I'm sorry. If they like. So if the, if um, if the designers of services design with a user in mind yeah. that is like themselves, yeah. but ordinary users are so different. Yeah. Like you picture them. What kinds of implications do you see? I mean, I think it's kind of as SDS uh, research has shown, it's often the case that design is has a specific user in mind, and then users are more creative and more or just too lazy to <laughs> to <laughs> use the technology in all the different ways. I think it's. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call this resistance because it's a strong term, but I think it's more like, yeah, maybe it's a creativity, maybe people, you know, yeah, I, I guess they're a bit more, um, they, not lazy, but you know, they, they want to do with the technology what they want to do, and it's not necessarily what they, what the tech creators imagine, and it's kind of, I think it's, it's, it's great that we have this variety of views, and I'm sure, you know, what I'm, what I would be interested uh, to know is, so, you know, to talk with people who maybe use it for a day or, you know, for an hour, and then they thought, oh, I cannot, you know, even engage with this technology because it's just too burdensome. Mm -hmm. So these kind of, there are different kinds of users, and non-users are also users. So I guess this is kind of the playfulness of technology, I would say. Is what comes out of this. Yes. Hi, thank you for a great paper. Um, I did some research on my fitness power a good few years ago now, so really personal interest um, to see this. I found, I just wanted to get your take on it really, which is kind of following on from what you touched on. Um, what about, did you have any kind of feedback from the participants about kind of the ethical dimensions of it? I think also the kind of, yeah, the unintended consequence of use. So things around um, people using it who have eating disorders, obviously because the input output, you know, uh, quant is caused so it kind of perpetuates, um, could potentially be very damaging. Yeah. And the embodied pressure from the device itself. Did you have any any understanding of that from the from the interviewees that they kind of felt that at all? Um, most of them were very positive about it, which was weird for me because when I use it, as you say, I was very stressed and anxious because it's very oppressive. Um, there was a one participant who was um, kind of driven to eating disorder through this app because it's, it gives you more control over your food and it's easy to become obsessed and minimize your intake. And one was really critical about it and said about self-disciplining. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's the kind of the bias of the research. Maybe they think I'm expecting them to be very positive about it. But, um, yeah, it just it, with the people generally were very critical, but maybe on the other hand, maybe they didn't like. Uh, that's what I you know, kind of question in my thesis. Maybe they weren't experiencing it as a as a um, kind of technology that's oppressive or that makes them act in certain ways. Because some of them, you know, they would just, for example, or during the weekends if they are going out with friends, they would just stop tracking because they don't want to know. You know, <laughs> it's fine. So I think you know there is again this kind of playfulness. It's not, mm. it's not following to the you know to the letter, and um, continuously. It's just finding, um, adapting the technology to your own needs. But I mean, it's not, not the whole story. I'm sure. I, I found just to follow up on that, some of my participants would uh, yeah just lie to the app. Yeah. Sort of <laughs> their data representation, what they're consuming or not, um, or exercising or not, became this lovely representation of what they wanted to yeah. perceive themselves as. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dave, and thank you for the paper. I, I've read it, and you made a slide. I think it's a really great paper. Um, I had a question when I was reading it about uh, the, the effects part. 
So in, in the beginning you say that yes, so the, the QS metaphor is about knowledge through numbers, right? And people who engage in mundane tracking, they, they normally just want to lose weight and look a little bit better on their way pictures. But um, in the end they also report uh, that they do look at the food in terms of calories, mm -hmm. right? And there is certain like increase in awareness about the eating habits. So my question to you is, do you think there is actual sort of potential for learning among these mundane trackers? And if there is, how can designers or policy makers utilize it in order to actually, you know, educate them and to make healthier choices? Mm, I guess there is, I mean, I mean, some, some of the participants said that, especially those who were doing it for longer periods, that you don't. In some instances, you don't no longer need an app. You kind of can gauge a, you know, that sandwich with uh, tuna will have that many calories, and the sandwich with bacon will be, you know, <laughs> more calorific. So you, you you kind of have this understanding. But then, you know, as I mentioned in the article, when when it ca comes because the app also gives these notifications about oh this food has a lot of like a lot of vitamin C or this food is high in fiber so. And, and this is supposed to be this kind of uh, knowledge building, as I, at least as I understand from the creators of the app, the interviews that I read, kind of they want to nudge people into healthier behaviors, but response from my participants was like, yeah, it's a great information, but that doesn't mean you know, I will eat more broccoli, or, you know. So, I mean, again, it's this is the question, and I guess this relates to what you were saying in your presentation, you know, have, how can, you know, whether people still have agency and they are still, you cannot just by giving this information necessarily, it means that people are taking up and doing something about it. Maybe they just read it and then it goes in the back of their mind and they never think about it again. So I, I guess it's very difficult to say, you know, how, how I guess the people in Silicon Valley are thinking about it, how to make this brilliant <laughs> brilliant technology that will teach people a healthy behavior. But I think, uh, I guess I'm really happy about my participants that they were not like so easily um, and the you know, they, that they were not actually listening to the app so strictly. So I, yeah, I think it's too complicated. <laughs> uh, <it's laughs> I have. Um, Great presentation. I have used this app in the past to, you know, to look at to, for that vacation or different things like that. Um, one problem that I did have with this app, well, that a lot of people do have is like, for example, I work at the school system and like eating lunch. There you're saying, okay, is this chicken sandwich? sort of like the Burger King chicken yeah. sandwich, or I'm using restaurants yeah, that you guys yeah. should know, or is it sort of like a McDonald's chicken sandwich? So you have to sort of pick and choose, and me, myself, I'm thinking, oh, Burger King's this lower in fat, okay, <laughs> we'll do this one. You know, something like that, because, yeah. but it's a great app, and you start thinking about, because I've used, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Weight Watchers app. Mm. It's about like that, you know, you start thinking when you use the app, you're thinking, okay, I, I need to go with this because it's lower in calorie. Yeah. And even though you don't use the app, you know, I use it for a little bit, then I get back on it, mm -hmm. then I don't, then you start, I mean, in your mind, you think, oh, this one was a little bit lower calorie, yeah. so I'm going to do check that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, some of my participants said, yeah, you know, I'm not DAFTA, of course I will choose the one with lower right. calories. But then again, others were very conscientious about it and they're like, I'm not going to lie, you know, I'm not lying to myself, so I'm going to stick with the, the higher calories, you know. Yeah. So, but then I guess there's kind of these ideas of self-disciplining and how people mm -hmm. are going about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah, I f think there's a general problem that like the comparison is on different levels because on the one hand you have like the discourse of the QS yeah. and on the other level you have the practices of what people are actually yeah. doing. Um, and I have been attending QS, a QS community mm -hmm. and I can really see like the discourse that you find in Maya and what Gary will say. I can really see mm -hmm. reflecting in what people do with it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very different level looking at the actual practices. Yeah, yeah. 
of people in Cubans. So this kind of optimization and self-disciplining, I, I didn't really find it um, when I when I talk to people. So I think that would be like a, a third category yeah. that you would need to have, like both like the discourse and how is it markets, and what do people <coughs> then actually do with the QS, and then the more like mon mundane yeah. uh, participant. But I, w I really really like the part we had on yeah both mm -hmm. both category, but I, I sort of like lack the category with the practice of the QS. Yeah. Um, but there's a gap in the literature there. Yeah, that's exactly. Because everything we have, there's so much written, but it's all mostly based on, on the meetup and the people in Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't really know what people do with it. Yeah. So, and I guess yeah. why it's, we're, we're talking about quantified solid metaphors, so it's more yeah. about the how subtracking is discussed in the literature yeah. um, and not necessarily about, you know, QS literature because the, the few works that are coming from there, uh, you know, the ones that you were citing, uh, uh, Sharon and FNAFs, they were talking more about, you know, they, exactly that th these people are not so obsessed and they don't have this optimization uh, discourse so much and they are a bit more creative, I guess, again, with their um, self-tracking. But then there would be you know, three categories, so the theoretical conceptual literature, then the QS community itself, and then kind of everyday self-track. Mm -hmm. Do we still have time? <laughs> yeah, the, the, yes, in principle, we have room for yeah. one more question. Thank you. So, uh, did any of your participants question whether calories is a good metric at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess few of them did. Um, but it was, I mean, I guess it's, the thing is, it worked for them. I guess it's just boils down to that that you know they they might have been critical about it um, to an extent, but then it was a way for them to control their eating and to achieve their results, and and it was yeah fine. I mean, I, I mean I was critical, <laughs> and, and somehow maybe that's why it didn't work for me. Um, <laughs> But well, they were just, just because in, in the curious community, actually, there's there's some kind of epistemological things going on where, like, criticizing calories at all is yeah. a good metric yeah. uh, for, for for trying to control your nutrition. Yeah, it's yeah. it's. I mean, I, I and, try and to sense, just say that there, there's also different there as as well as you said, mm -hmm. that that the, the calorie metric. Is really adopted from biomedical science, right? And then put into something on. Yeah. But there, there are actually things going on in the QS community where that is being questioned. Yeah. yeah. And 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 well, I can say we have been looking for other ways of of uh, of looking at our own body and uh, gathering data. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I guess uh, from my personal perspective, as a, and in my thesis, I also question this <coughs> approach. And, but uh, from the, pers per, the participants, they were they were kind of taking it for granted the, the meaning of it. And as I said, they kind of looked at it as an expert app, um, you know, based on um, some kind of expert knowledge, and it worked. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Sari Yuli Kahuluam and I'm going to present you uh, a paper that is based on an empirical study that I'm conducting with Minna Ruckenstein. And this is very much work in progress as you, as you can see from the change of the title. So, um, as we have heard already from the previous presentations, there is actually um, a quite high expectations um, that are set on devices' abilities to produce data currently that could produce, um, that could help people, for example, to increase people's self-knowledge or to promote overall health and wellness. So this, there is really this, this hype on and uh, accelerating interest on self-tracking technologies. Now people, people may have a different uh, sort of uh, self-tracking style. Some people just document uh, their, their data while some really want to conduct some sort of a behavior change. 
And uh, we can say actually that, uh, for example, technology experts may have different kind of expectations on, on data produced by self-tracking te technologies uh, in, in comparison, for example, uh, to users of their self-tracking technologies. But essentially, if we, if we think about the users, we can, we can perhaps argue that people essentially want data that is somehow lively, meaning that, that the data is somehow meaningful for themselves, that when they want to do something with their data. Okay, now uh, in order to, to, to have data that is lively, one of the key prerequisites is actually that people can have a connection to their data, that they can have access to their data. And uh, basically we can say that connectivity is actually a flow um, that contains of both connects and disconnects. Uh, that can be both voluntary and involuntary disconnects. Now uh, voluntary uh, disconnects mean actually that if you turn the device off, then you have no connection um, to your device and then you produce no data. But the problem is with those um, involuntary disconnects that may happen that, to not, that connections are for some reasons simply just not working. There are some sort of connective gaps in your, in your data, in your data flow. And these are actually problematic uh, that when, when people have these high hopes and desires, uh, but, but what they get is that they, they just face these failing connections. Then they, um, they get frustrated, helple helpless and feel distress. So what we are doing is that we, we have tried to look at these connective gaps and what happens actually there, uh, how people react and um, what, what people think about this. And here is, um, here is the context of our empirical study. We have been involved in a, in a pilot study that is called Digital Health Revolution. That is except, uh, actually a pilot that, um, that um, was conducted from October 2015 and it ended this year, January, in January 2017. There were essentially 100 um, healthy volunteers participating in this in this study. And it was a huge pilot study, meaning that there were really, um, uh, there were many parties involved, many, many, many people involved in this also from the research perspective. And really uh, many types of uh, lifestyle monitoring data was, was collected during that pilot study. Um, additionally, there were also personal trainers in, involved um, trying to help people conduct uh, some sort of a behavior change chains and there were group meetings also five uh, five separate group meetings where people met in in small groups and and, and uh, lectures were giving and uh, those were also they were also part of uh, part of the pilot trying to help people to conduct behavior change but what we were looking at we were looking at uh, the um, the self-tracking applications that were also involved in this pilot study, and particularly the Weddings Activity Pop. Um, there were also apps like Moves and Rescue Time, but what we realized was that people were not essentially using them. It was mainly, mainly Weddings that the people were using. So we interviewed 27 participants last, last spring, and um, nine of those interviewees were inexperienced in self-tracking. This means that they had no previous experience and they sort of thought that, okay, it's going to be rather difficult for them to learn to use the, this self-tracking device. Uh, nine of those interviews were uh, experienced, meaning that they had previous experience um, uh, in the use of some sort of self-tracking device. But interestingly, they had actually quit using um, those previous self-tracking devices. And then there were nine extreme uh, interviewees in, in, in self-tracking and these people had, um, they had either um, used, they had uh, in simultaneous use at least one device that they had used uh, for 24 
um, a month or then they uh, had at least two different devices in use at the same time than this feeding device. And here's one more picture uh, about Withings and the Withings Health Mate, <coughs> what, it, what it looks like. Okay, what are um, our findings so far? Now, um, people were actually mainly, first of all, using visible data. That was, that was the first prerequisite. They wanted their data to be visible. But this was a very typical example uh, of a female, 40 years old, uh, 47 years old female uh, who was experienced in self-tracking. She says, I don't really know what has happened here. What does it mean that all the colors are missing here? Mm -hmm. Is it that I have been somewhere in the middle of the night? Where have I been? It's almost exactly one hour. It may sometimes happen that if I have fallen asleep, I go and let the dogs in at night, but I do not remember that it would have been that would have been the case here. All of a sudden there is an empty space. Most likely it would have taken me 15 minutes. It wouldn't take me that long. Now here's a person who is conducting shift work and she has also horses and other animals that she's taking care of. And she's trying to keep track of, of the amount of, of, uh, of the sleep because she wants to be sure that she, she gets enough sleep um, uh, during the night. This is also something that the personal uh, trainers have been, have been telling her that she needs to be really aware of that. But then um, the device is not functioning properly or she's not able to use the device properly and she gets these connective gaps and she's, she gets really confused. Now, uh, this was not the only case. It was also the in, inexperienced and extreme uh, self-trackers who were facing the invisibility of the data. For example, there was one extreme uh, self-tracker uh, who was training for a marathon run and she, she, it, the, the amount of the training was really amazing what, was, what she was doing. And she needed to keep close track of, of her data because she wanted to uh, avoid physical overstraining. And she uh, noticed that not all of her activities was not um, tracked. She didn't, she didn't uh, gain um, all the data that, that she was doing, although it was running or cycling or, or, or even just walking. Um, and, um, and this was a really big problem for her. So, um, this was really, uh, they, these people were looking for, for visible data, but what, what they received was confusing because the data didn't actually show any change perhaps. Um, uh, or, or, they, or it didn't basically provide any answers, but, but it actually raised more questions than provided answers. The activities simply remained invisible and it was perplexing for the, for the participants. Now, beside visibility, um, uh, the participant, participants uh, wanted for accuracy. Now, here is one person who says, it does not measure sleep in a best possible way. I may lie in bed awake for an hour, meaning that I have been still and it has not moved. Then it has thought that I have slept that time too. It, pra it praises me having slept well, even if I had slept way too little. This has naturally been annoying. I have used medication to be able to sleep. I first thought that this application is useful. I could mark down those nights when I have taken medication to be able to comp compare those to my sleeping data. It doesn't work that way as it does not measure sleep properly. Now here was a person who really, who was re really desperate uh, for gaining um, some sort of help or assistance, assistance for, for her sleep, sleep problems. Um, and she was at the same time trying to get rid of the medication as well. Uh, she didn't really want to use any sleeping pills. But, uh, but the, this device, she put high hopes on this device to help her, but she didn't get, get any help from the, from the device because the data was somehow broken or there were these connectivity uh, gaps in, in, in her data. So it, uh, it raised questions, uh, does, the does this device really function properly? And then these people, when they face these accuracy problems, they also had, uh, 
had doubts in them in themselves. Am I really so stupid that I cannot use this device? This was really something that many people people were um, were thinking about, and they they felt simply disappointed because they wanted actually to verify this, this data, but they were not able to able to 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 do that because there were these these gaps. And finally, what this this led led into that. As, as these people were facing these problems, they, they gained data that was not visible and gained, they gained data that was not accurate. It, it became meaningless actually for them. So here is one female who's, who says there are bars to show deep and light sleep, but it doesn't give you accurate data. It's so and so. Even if you go to bed early, it may show something different. Or on some mornings, it may show that I have woken up in an hour earlier, even though I haven't. I really don't know why. I do not trust it completely as it acts strangely like that. I just think on the data uh, that maybe it's, it shows what has been the case or then not. So here's, here's some, uh, one, one person who's, who was really open to sort of um, to try this device and, and to, to try to gain somehow meaningful data, but um, it didn't provide her anything and therefore the data is actually just to remain data. It was nothing else. It was just meaningless and, and dead. And th this person in particular, she had just actually surrendered in her attempts to, to understand the data, the, device, um, the data and device. She just kept the device because she had promised to be participant in this, in this, in this uh, study. Now, um, here in, in the first presentation, um, um, uh, it was mentioned the social context on or the community of data and and it, I, I, I completely agree that the community or, or the social context is important because some of the participants they were sort of trying to compare their data to other participants here and they were not able to interpret their data because they they actually did not see the other people's data they could not reflect or, or talk about um, what does it mean to you or or how does the, how does your data data look like so uh, so this uh, this led also into these feelings of indifference so what are our conclusions so far so our conclusion so far is that that these people in this pilot study at least they were actually searching uh, or desperately actually searching for some kind of con connection to their data but uh, there quite often actually existed these connectivity gaps and these gaps proved to be quite hard to bridge actually. Or when they tried to hard bridge them, it was quite a lot of work and still not successful. And, um, and these gaps actually appeared when, it, when the data remained invisible or inaccurate and this generated feelings of confusion and doubt. And these were actually quite dangerous, these invisibility or inaccuracy feelings uh, or, or experiences, because this led to, to frustration and feelings of in, indifference and people didn't want to continue or continue trying to, do, to use their devices properly or trying to search for, uh, search for um, some sort of meaningful interpretations. So, so high expectations that we put on these devices, they actually do not necessarily materialize. And uh, this is sort of problematic, particularly when, when people are sort of expected to take more charge of their, their uh, health and, uh, and, uh, and be more uh, proactive in behavior change. Because, because if they, if they uh, gain these feelings of of uh, meaningfulness, um, it just does not function. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes, please. I think you, this is very uh, informative and amazing to hear what you're researching. I, I am kind of very curious um, to, to, to ask you what uh, because you talk a bit about the connectivity and the gaps that appear where there is no data or for different reasons. But I'm kind of also curious about this kind of, from some of the statements, there is kind of this kind of almost like inability of them to, ex 
experience their own body due to the art or um, or uh, kind of like I don't know when you were talking about the runner I think or someone who, who was running that they need the app in order to kind of feel can they not feel when they're kind of <laughs> reaching their physical limit so it kind of like in a way talks about this kind of uh, so much reliance and I think in the Hedge film that will come out as well that uh, some <coughs> people rely so much on the apps that they forget in a way to read their body signals which in a way can return us to Anne-Marie Moll kind of research yes. she did kind of two decades ago <laughs> about the diabetes kind of uh, study in diabetes studies but um, so I'm kind of just curious is it really um, do you think it's just a connectivity issue or is it kind of this kind of over reliance on kind of devices and I agree with you because I think that it's very dangerous also to prescribe apps. I think that it's a common practice, at least in UK, where uh, now GPs can kind of prescribe, I don't know, mindfulness for mental, kind of minor mental health issues, which kind of, I feel that if someone is experiencing a mental health kind of breakdown and give them an app, <laughs> for me it's kind of completely, I don't know, I <laughs> find it very yes. but, um, uh, and, and just kind of like, um, so, so yes. So yes. Um, I think this person in particular, I think, um, I mean, she was amazing. I, I, I've never met a person who is so active as she was. <laughs> and um, she called herself as a Duracell buddy because she, she needed to do everything all the time. And, and I think, um, I'm not quite sure. I think because she was she was also wearing many devices, uh, and uh, I think she wanted to be just sure because she was so enthusiastic to to do exercise all the time. Really, like um, run uh, 20 kilometers in the morning and go to the gym in the afternoon, and and she she really wanted to avoid this. And I think she wanted to, she, she searched for some sort of confidence from the device. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that she relied completely on the device, but I think she just wanted to, uh, she just wanted to have a sort of an alarm clock mm -hmm. that, that she has set on that, okay, just remember. I think that that's sort of, but I think it, it was sort of a, also a balance for her. Yes. Yes, please. Hi, thank you for a great paper. Um, I'm really interested in about kind of looking at uh, the previous paper to this one in terms of the inaccuracy and how that's received by the individuals. Mm -hmm. um, because I think before sometimes the inaccuracy can be quite celebrated because that gives you the representation you want. But obviously in this case, if you are trying to really monitor, say, your sleep, for example, it's not it's not being accurate, and a lot of the sleep ones are you know really problematic and how they capture the data. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, that the inaccuracy is frustrating for the individual. But I wondered whether any of the participants were interested in the kind of competition with their with themselves. Um, so, if it's capturing this data, whether then the next night's sleep or the following night's sleep, they wanted to get a better night's sleep than the one before. Mm. Um, whether that became kind of a part of this process at all, with the um, whether it was inaccurate or not, um, because obviously. We all know how we feel in the morning when we've had a good or bad night's sleep, but sometimes the data representation, when you're talking about the, um, the capturing of the data and how we embody that and yes. feel gratified by it can make us feel better or worse, regardless of what, how we've actually slept. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested in the kind of the sharing aspect and whether they kind of shared it amongst themselves like, as mm. well, because I think that um, I did a little bit of work on sleep cycle and okay. some of my participants shared it with other people just on private, okay. private groups and they found that that was. Um, a really motivating tool to try and get like, a better night's sleep than your friends. Mm -hmm. yes. really competitive. Yes. I, anyway, just wondered whether you'd had any of Yes. Well, actually, uh, these people, they were not sharing their data with, with other participants. But uh, um, about this competition, yes, I remember one participant, uh, at least one participant, who was talking about this competition with herself uh, in particular. And um, she also had big sleeping problems and uh, she said that that okay I, I really tried my best and I was really happy that okay now I noticed that I I managed to go to bed at 11 o'clock in, in the evening I was really proud of myself 
But then, Teresa had disappeared. And, and she was really like, it's, it's not, she, she said that, I know that I'm doing this for myself. I really know that I, I'm basically competing with myself and I'm, I'm doing this for myself. But she was so disappointed that she thought, why am I doing this? Because I can't show to the personal trainer that I really went to bed at 11 o'clock and I, I slept <laughs> more hours than the previous night. Why should I do this? <laughs> and I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, that this this showing aspect was was there but like I said these people did not share their data uh, only with their personal trainer the personal trainers uh, were able to see the data if the participants wanted to show that to, to them but not not really otherwise but yeah, even the anxiety that causes if they can't prove that yes to yes so. but other uh, about competition about the steps um, this, all the participants, they actually came from four different organizations and at least in one organization there were small, smaller groups where they, where they uh, shared their data on steps, not, not on sleep but, but on steps and there were these, I think there are these leaderboards and so, but, but it, it managed to sort of be interesting for these people like only in the beginning uh, because we interviewed them again in January and all of them had already forgotten that, that there was this sort of competition and it, it managed to be exciting only only in the beginning and only regarding steps. Yes, please. Um, thank you for a very nice presentation. I have a question um, and it's a little bit also related to uh, conclusions that we've heard from previous presentation. Um, so you're saying that uh, in your conclusions uh, that um, your participants actively looked for connections, right, in their data, so they engaged in some sort of reflection. Um, from a previous presentation, you know, for example, that um, there wasn't much uh, learning or a reflection in, in the process of this mundane tracking. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, like, how um, maybe your sample is different, maybe these people had some goals that they wanted to reach or, or some other things that made them more reflective in the process of tracking. Yes, well, I think the, the context is really important here because these, these were pilot study participants and these were volunteers and there were di different reasons why people wanted to participate in this pilot study, but, but this was sort of in the, it was after three months when we interviewed after three months that when they had received their their activity risks and they were sort of still quite of um, at least some of them were still somehow excited about this this risks <laughs> and uh, and um, but but I think many of them had sort of a larger goal in their in their mind that I was not fully aware of their goals in this pilot study why were they why were they here but but at least they were somehow motivated to participate in this in this in this study so i think it was uh, the setting was a little bit different because the, I, I was thinking similarly that the novelty of the, of the process of this new experience maybe was the primer for, for this reflection maybe and and the regarding the pilot study um it was basically these um these physiological measurements and clinical labs that were really or and genotype typing data that, that was really that was really uh, in the main focus in in this in this pilot study so they got their blood samples taken uh, i think five times during this uh, during this uh, period and it was analyzed and the, the data was uh, returned to them and uh, that was really the main thing but this was sort of this uh, self tracking application was sort of the something additional mm. to make them more participatory also which is quite interesting also <laughs> from the from the from the um, context perspective yes please yeah um, thank you so much for a great presentation i really like that you dwell on these gaps and what it actually does to people because this is one of the things that happens when there's such a great hype and then people really take it on themselves when it when it's not working right. So something that should be making them more competent and help them reach yes. their health goals, and then they actually end up feeling very very frustrated. 
um, I think what's a lot, lots of, of other kinds of research in the area would also say, well, then let's fix the gaps, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And as technology evolves, because all of these huge companies are developing mm. these technologies, a lot of the gaps in time maybe will close, right? Um, there will be perhaps mm -hmm. fewer sinking problems and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But maybe there is also, and I'm just speculating wildly, maybe there is also something positive in these gaps, as we saw in my mm. fitness pal. Or then the user can stay in control in specific ways because they can almost use these gaps, or they can really, they know what the data really says, but not what's in the app and these mm -hmm. kinds of things. So I'm just trying to think um, both like will we ever fully close those gaps, and mm -hmm. what is lost if we close all those gaps? Like maybe there is something positive. Did you see anything coming from this where people enjoyed that maybe it didn't track on yeah. the? If you can start wrapping up now, that would be great for the next session. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, quite quickly. No. <laughs> no, actually. But what I saw that people were trying to repair their data. They were they, to re repair their data, actively close those gaps. But otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.